Well, good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you this morning. I thank you for coming on this wonderful day. It's Sunday before Christmas. Christmas just a few days away, next Saturday. I can't wait, boys and girls. We got a special uh, time this morning for you, a very special service. And uh, I hope that you're going to be blessed. I know you are as we share together. And I'll say just right now, Brother Philip has gone on vacation uh, down in, I think, in the, I was thinking Texas, but he and his family for Christmas to visit family. And so he pre recorded hymns for us and uh, things. And Savannah has agreed to lead us. And we got the kids' church up here today that's going to have a song for us. And then Savannah will be doing some special music for us before I come to share with you the message. So we got a, a wonderful Sunday morning uh, of worship planned out for you, and I hope that you enjoy that uh, as much as I know that I'm going to. By the way, there's no Sunday school next Sunday morning. Still have the worship service at 1030. So, uh, and I welcome, by the way, our Facebook live stream folks, um, different ones I've, I've talked to and said they couldn't make it today. And... Uh, be praying for them for their health and different things but uh, just please notice those things and if you haven't signed up for men's bible study there's a there's a sign up list out on the bulletin board in the foyer we'll be doing the study no excuses uh, tony evans pastor down in texas uh, great preacher uh, author uh, pastors a large church down there. I've heard him on conferences over the years speaking. Dr. Tony Evans wrote this study on no excuses. It's about eight uh, months we'll have this session. And uh, several names I noticed. Thank you for those that signed up. The books are $15 a piece for the study, your own workbook. And we'll be starting that in January and probably be doing it on Saturday morning. Brother Bill with a breakfast, you know. Uh, I, I know some guys that likes to fix breakfast around here. Uh, but uh, we'll have a, a time of fellowship around the table with breakfast and things. And guys, we'll have our Bible study. And at those times, and working out, so it's once a month. We'll be announcing that time in January for us to do it. And if you can't afford the book, if you bring somebody or whatever, we'll take care of paying that book, okay? That's uh, no questions asked. You just let me know. You sign up and then let me know. Uh, Brother Odell, I, I, I can't pay for the book. If you'll take care of it, I appreciate it, and I'll take care of it for you. Um, have it taken care of, okay? I'll do it that way. And I got a call um, Friday, I guess it was, from dear friends that made it anonymous. They heard us on live stream uh, talking about Wednesday night in our fireside chat. And, yes, we'll have fireside chat this coming Wednesday night. Uh, but we will also have a special baptism service uh, on Wednesday night. So, Brian, get me some more water, brother, and um, uh, starting at the beginning of that service. So we're excited about that, and you'll get to uh, meet the person that's going to be baptized at the end of the service this morning. Uh, the time is coming. And so I'm going to save that as a special and give you a little information about that later on. Um, Let's see, Lord's Supper next Sunday morning is going to be a special service. I'd like to ask you to kind of enter in, uh, you know, I'm just not one to ask you kind of quietly and reverently like that. You know, I like the fellowship, the talk, and the laughter, and the mixture of things like that. But the whole service of next Sunday, and Brian, we'll get ready. We're doing the uh, communion cups as we did before with the wafer on top of the uh, grape juice and things to everybody to have. But a very special service next Sunday morning at 1030 will be focused upon taking communion together. So we, and that will be the service. So we hope that you'll plan to be here and be a part of that service, okay? And we'll enter in just finding your place like you always do. Because uh, what we're about is just come and worship the Lord. For those of you that are visiting with us, we're so glad to have you today. We love you and thank you for being here Read the rest of your bulletin for the announcements and things that are listed there. And um, we'll have Brother Bill. Let's see. Before you do, Brother Bill, Miss Carol, I think you have uh, something you wanted to say this morning. So come on up, ma'am. At this time of the year, we 
we want to stop and give pause and and say thanks to all of our staff that have served the church so faithfully through the year with their with their love with their service with their prayers and uh, pastor is up here i would like to ask for natalie to come up here if she's upstairs nope there she is and um john stewart i saw him out in the hallway i don't know if he's still here or not but would like for you to come up uh, we have a small token of of our appreciation for pastors for you and deborah and this is for natalie and i just again want to thank them on behalf of all of the orchard crest family for what they do not just on sundays but but you know when your church staff you're uh, on duty 20 here comes john you're on duty 24 7 it seems and so we want to make certain that we extend them our love our thanks and our appreciation. We have a gift for you at Christmas time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Let's go thank to you, the Lord Lord. in prayer as we thank him. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you today, Lord, and we thank you for each person on our staff, Lord. We thank you that they do their job with diligence, but most of all, Lord, we thank you for the heart that they have to serve you, the people of this church, and our neighboring community. Guide and direct them, watch over them, bless their lives, and every way and every day father god we love you and may we use each day to bring you more glory honor and praise in all that we do we love you jesus and thank you so much for these people amen amen thank you miss carol thank you orchard crest we love you all of our staff natalie's our financial administrator and secretary john does the grounds the yard and stuff outside and things and thank you so much for all of that and all that you do and, and I just want to say how honored I am to be your pastor uh, here in Deborah to be alongside me she's really the pastor of the pastor you know and uh, but I appreciate and love her so much and thank you we enjoy being here with you all um, Bill if you'll come on up with your ushers and taking up an offering and let me mention uh, and Miss Carol is our personnel chairperson and we thank her and the team and for all your gifts and all the church let me mention while these guys are coming uh, some prayer concerns and then um, we'll have our prayer time before we take up our offering. Uh, Bob Chambers passed away. We prayed for him last week and he was the homeschool football assistant coach that uh, where Phil and Jeannie then went to Florida and they actually won the uh, national homeschool football game that was down in Florida when they did it but he had COVID, and a very loved man, uh, Bob Chambers. So we want to pray for that dear family. Also, uh, key families that are devastated by the storm in Kentucky. And what I was going to tell you is somebody was listening, and they sent us a check, and, uh, a check that would go to that. They heard me mention on live stream Wednesday night, and I'll say it here today, that we'll be taking up an offering if you'd like to give love offering or something designated toward uh, those families, uh, churches, or different ones. I've got in contact with my pastor down in that I surrendered to preach under in 1974, and uh, he's going to get back with me um, about the churches and things, the director of missions in that area for around Dawson Springs, Princeton, and Mayfield. Uh, so that we can send a little love gift down to them. So if you want to be a part of that, we already have a check in the mail that is coming for that. And I thank God uh, for our friends that listens by way of Facebook to send that. And we'll let you know uh, as that time comes and we'll have it in the bulletin what we send to those folks and who it was that we minister to. And uh, also all the folks that are traveling on this holiday, remember them. Pray for our nation and people around the world and all the unspoken requests you lift up as our usher who's praying this morning, Brian. And Brian, if you'll come and uh, you, you lift up that prayer within your heart as God speaks to you. Thank you, Brian. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just praise you this time of year. We praise you for Jesus and sending, sending your son to be born in a manger and, and that he may pay the price for our sins dear lord we just pray that you uh, be in our hearts and just help us to realize the reason for this season and to honor you in every way that we can 
to obey and 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 follow you and and ultimately be saved by you and uh, and we just pray for uh, uh, us as a church dear lord that you uh, just help us to serve your purpose and uh, and uh, and be led by you we ask you to bless this offering uh, just thank you for the means that you bless us with and we as we give uh, that portion to you that you so graciously deserve we ask you or we pray for its wise use and uh, and we also pray that you uh, just open our eyes and uh, and our ears to to uh, see and uh, and to hear your message this morning, dear Lord, uh, and we pray that you bless the Pastor as uh, as he gives it, and we love you and praise you and pray all these things in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brian. God bless you. Brian is our chamber of deacons. For those that we've had several join the church this year, you might not know who everybody is, and we'll try to. Make sure you do that. So let's stand together. Miss Savannah Bowers is going to come. Her, they, Savannah and her mom, Carmen and Murphy, these kids, uh, does kids' church every Sunday. So you don't see them. They're downstairs. So we have kids' church available for everyone. And Carmen, thank you for what you do. They have an exciting time. So they're going to get you fired up later on this morning. These kids are going to come. But Savannah, you come and lead us in our hymn as uh, the guys are taking up the offering. Come on, praise team. Jesus laid down his sweet head. 
was a little hard to hear that music. Uh, <laughs> okay, so now we're having the kids come up. And I tell you, this has been such a fun time to have these kids downstairs and to be investing with them. Um, I know that my mom had kind of wanted to say a few things. Oh, I'm going to say it now. But we, we weren't aware that we were going to be up here. And so the songs that um, we had been practicing are not Christmas songs. But I think we'll still enjoy singing them, and you guys will still be blessed um, by getting a little sneak peek into how we start our service um, downstairs on Sunday mornings. Say what? Yes, these are just two of them. These, I think, are their favorites right now.
Okay, now we're gonna do just a little bit of showing off. And for the first six weeks, we did, we have little planters downstairs and we are planting seeds of the word into our lives. And we are learning memory verses. And they are, we are already on our second set of six, but we're gonna show off our first set of six for you. And um, Bethany's gonna start us off by telling you what we are calling these, okay? We are planting the seeds of God's word in our hearts. Your word I have hid in my heart that I might not stand against you. Psalm 119, 11. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Mark 12, 30. Be a friend. Psalm one night. No. <gasps> Hebrews thirteen six. Hebrews fourteen six. He's a helper, and I will not be afraid. Hebrews sixteen eleven. The joy of the Lord is your strength, Nehemiah 8.10. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Philippians 4.4. 4. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 15, 1.
Wow. His old saying was to never bless your socks off. I tell you, Miss Savannah, oh, thank you, honey. Thank you, precious kids. Miss Carmen, Lord have mercy, what you're teaching those kids down in kids' church. I wish you had 50 Amen. kids down there. We need to help her get more kids. You see what they're learning and things of what all is going on. And kids, you all were fabulous. They're amazing kids, and I just thank God for you. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing with us today. In, in worship here on Big Church. You're almost making us, I'll probably lose some crowd here. They'll want to come down to Kids Church and hear all you all worshiping up there. But uh, I am so glad that you're a part of Orchard Crest and blessing us right now with what we're doing. And uh, we appreciate each of you coming today. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to open them, if you would, to the Gospel of Luke. We'll be reading in chapter 2, verse 42 through verse 52 and the title of the message today yeah you guys can go on back and I appreciate you uh, being there no kids church today I don't think y'all staying up here okay uh, title of the message today is growing up growing up Luke 2 verse 42 through 52 and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinfolks and acquaintances." And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wist you not, or know you not, that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with man. Would you pray with me? We thank you, Father, for this day. And looking forward to the celebration on Christmas morning of the birth of Christ our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who... Christ being the anointed one, the expected Messiah, we thank you that he was born, has come, not only upon the earth, but also in our hearts, and saved us from our lostness, that we can now, through the power of the Holy Spirit and your divine word, to understand more about this journey and about your purpose for our life. Grant to us understanding, forgive us, Lord, bless us, through your grace and mercy, fill us with your Holy Spirit today as we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, you don't hear much about the life of Jesus in that period of his stay on the earth between the ages of 12 to 30. It's almost like he didn't exist. Don't hear anything about it. We get the birth when he was born in the manger. And then it's like there for so many years after he's born in the manger. And then they go because Herod is seeking to kill Jesus, baby Jesus, because he heard there's a king that is born. And great proclamations going out. It brings great stress to the family. Imagine being uprooted and moved and, and going out into different areas and try to be secluded and live a life that is not drawing attention. Having a baby son named Jesus who is God in flesh here that can 
you know, calm seas and waters and do all kinds of miracles and things. And, but we don't hear anything outside of the miracle of the birth of Jesus when he was born in the manger. Until we come 12 years later. Have you ever thought, you know, I, I know what people, and we've had this discussion on, in Farside Chat. And by the way, Wednesday night we'll be having, again, I say Farside Chat, but we'll start out with a baptismal service uh, this coming Wednesday night at 6.30. But imagine, you know, here it says Jesus was 12 years old. For a long time, I, I saw in churches of old time that they would say, well, it's about time you get saved. You know, well, you know, any, any time when God's dealing with you is a great time to get saved, but it's not. When you think about where did that come from? How did that, how did we get to the point to say, okay, you're getting old enough now to kind of maybe understand or coming to the place to where you need to be saved. And I've heard people use that age 12 as an, the age of accountability. It was Jewish tradition that when uh, was formed back over the years. It says that they were the family was traveling because Jewish tradition was was young boys reached the age of twelve that they began to be tutored and taught the Jewish laws as they were doing, and they began to practice it. They had their first Passover when they came to that time to really celebrate the, of what it meant and these feasts. So Joseph and Mary comes along with a caravan that travels. Some have said typically a caravan could travel 18 to 30 miles a day, but usually when they were coming like this at this particular time, the first day they would travel about six miles. So when you look at the sea that they traveled, they were a three-day journey away. They could have possibly been 50 to 60 miles away from Jerusalem time they came there. They traveled one day going back, and typically when they left the place of Jerusalem, they traveled about six miles because in case, get this, they forgot something. They wouldn't have so far to go back. Now remember, they can't just jump in the Mercedes or the Volkswagen Beetle and take off or to do what, to get, zoom, go back. Oh, I... I've, you ever, I mean, I'm taking off and you can't, you can't take off and forget your keys. You know, that's one thing. But you can, you billfold, your purse, your glass, your cell phone, you know, all these different things. Oh, I forgot that and going out and doing, I forget. One time, uh, I remember at church when folks left the church back several years ago. And uh, they got away and we, we went into the nursery and a kid was left in the nursery. It's the truth. The family got, man, they got, because they had a bunch of kids. And, and they did. They had, they had four or five kids. And they got them all packed up and going out, took off, left the church. And uh, the nurse worker said, they didn't come and pick up little Johnny, let's say. And, you know, it was, so we waited about 30 minutes till they figured it out as they was traveling in their van and going back and doing head counts and saying, where is everybody? And then it was like, oh, you know, it's all this. And, and so they came back. I live right beside the church in the parsonage. And it was so, I mean, it was scary, but it was funny, you know. When they come back in there, like so uh, ashamed because they have left. And you think, well, how could that happen? You've probably lost kids at, in, in the mall shopping. You know, you do something that, because, well, the little rascals go and hide sometimes. Or they're doing things. So, I mean, it's different things. I can remember my son doing the same thing. Me as a pastor, we was going and we was shopping. And, and he had a crazy uncle that would tell him because he had uh, something that was called um, ehlers Danlos is what he has, syndrome, which is a rare skin disease, a connective disease. That's what Houdini had. Houdini, you know, he could get in a straight jacket and get out, and he could do all kinds of things. Well, Greg found out he has this. And so as a little boy, well, he could just wrap his arms around and touch his, you know, touch his nose. I can't even get him halfway around, let alone to do, or do it, wrapping his arms around or nod himself up and, and, and just all kinds of crazy things. If I pulled my skin up like this on my finger, that's as far as it'll go. It's amazing, as old as I am, they don't go, you know, like this. But he could just, as a kid, go pull his skin up because elasticity of it, of what that disease carries. So his uncle tells him, says, son, you are to be, man, you could be in the circus. 
You're, I mean, you, people ought to be paying you for all the things you could do because he was a crowd getter, attention getter. And uh, so he did, we was over to the mall shopping and we're saying, where's Greg? You know, I don't know, he's probably six or seven or something and we're looking. And usually when you see crowds gathered, you think, oh no, there's a fight. But then my heart was pounding trying to look for that little rascal through out there and he was out on the, at, at the front of the store on the street there and uh, there was a crowd of people that was gathered out there and he was down on the ground and he was bending his leg back over this and hooking around his neck. He said, can you do this? And he was, you know, he was down on the black top and doing this and he was getting quarters, you know. It was just like people just throwing. His crazy uncle set him up for that to try to, you got to be careful what you tell kids in their mind, right? But he was just, you know, so doing it. I mean, I panicked when I realized he wasn't there and you got Christmas shopping or all kinds of different things going. And old Greg had his own uh, mind about what he was going to be doing. And um, so it was kind of crazy. So, yeah, I've experienced that sense of, of doing that. So I can imagine here is Joseph and Mary, and they look through the caravan. They're looking through with everything going through because this caravan was large of kinfolks and people. They came down to celebrate the feast of the Passover the different feasts, three different feasts that was involved in what they were doing, and they would do the Passover. And there would be teaching, there would be scripture, there would be church. It's like saying we came into a, a time of a special church service that we were setting up. And so when they went through, can you imagine their heart? As they would think, they couldn't find him. They thought, well, he's just running with some of his cousins or doing this or that. He's, you know, doing it. They never paid any attention. But as they kept noticing, he hadn't checked in. And when they found out that he was missing, it says after one day's journey, they've been traveling, that then they went back. And, it, and when they went back, it actually kind of took them, as we can see in the scripture here, about three days for them to actually find him, to find him out because of the different stops, you know. Well, we stopped there and went in. I remember I went in that store and we went in here and we stopped there went because... It's a lot of people that are gathered there. And so when you stop in and all the places, so there's a panic to say, you know, isn't that amazing? You would think Jesus was lost, but he's never been lost. But there's a lot of other people that are. And the Bible says that's why he came was so that he could save those who are lost. He didn't come for the righteous. He came for those who are lost which means that we're in our sins, that we are, here we are, we have the need of a Savior. And when they looked, and then that's where we find him, and, and you know the answer when, so they find him up to this 12 years, and he says to them, don't you know, he says, here we are sorrowing, don't you know, with the trouble you caused in our hearts and all this pain and, and, and stuff that was coming? And he said, don't you know, I must be about my father's business. Jesus never lost the emphasis of why he came. Never did. The whole time. And that's what we celebrate before Christmas, that we understand why Jesus came. And so at his birth, the shepherds announced it, the angels announced it to them. They came and proclaimed it. The wise men came and proclaimed it. And we had that gap up until 12 years. And as we look into the scripture today to see, here's a little boy. And where does he go? You know, most kids don't really want to go to church unless they're kind of ready for it and having a pretty good time or for an understanding about God to worship God. And that's why I thank God for having kids' church helps us to have the desire where kids can come and learn on their level. But Jesus wasn't at kids' church. Jesus was in... The big church. And here he was sitting there with the doctors and teachers, the learners, all the educated people. And what we looked at in the scripture, we noticed something here because there was purpose for what he was doing. That as he sat there, that he, he could ask he could ask and interchange with them on their level about things and even things that stunned them as that they were amazed, astonished at his understanding and at his answers and at his questions. Because when he would inject things to say to them, do you know, you know, 
the Lord still asks questions of us, don't he? The Lord gives us answers, things that comes within our life. So this is what Jesus was doing when he said that. And, of course, then the, his mom and his dad, and they were amazed as they found him. And at his reply, I know that Joseph and Mary must have kept that in their heart. And it says in the scripture that she did so. But even Joseph. And for some people, let me answer a question. Because Mary was a virgin when she had Jesus as a baby. She was a virgin before and knew no man. And what makes Jesus special is that God is his father, that the Holy Spirit moved upon her. And the angel said that, that what you're going to have is of God, that God has blessed you. This is the Messiah for all those people. This was the Christos, the anointed one, the promised one from Isaiah, 700 and something years before that with Jesus' birth, but there are some people out there because later on, Mary and Joseph have children. And even the Bible will say, well, isn't this his brothers and sisters? And he's the son of Joseph. And they tried to discount him because they didn't believe in him. But some people have said, well, his, Joseph had other kids because he's older than Mary. So Joseph was married before he married Mary and had other kids and things. The Bible doesn't, of course, say that. But that's the speculations that people try to use to excuse the fact to keep Mary as the virgin. To keep her as, as though Mary is deity. Mary needed Jesus as her savior, just like you and I do. Mary, Mary couldn't go to heaven without Jesus. She wasn't beyond the fact except that God chose her for a specific purpose, and that was to give birth to the baby Jesus. And she understood any time that she was around, she said, you do whatever he says. She could give mother instructions. She could do all those things. But Jesus was following his father's instructions. Jesus was listening to the heavenly father. That's what he was saying. So they were all amazed. And Jesus, they go to Nazareth. And, of course, Jesus grows up as a Nazarene for 18 years. Nothing. Nothing. Until one day that we'll see when he comes uh, there in John the Baptist as he steps into the Jordan River. And John the Baptist, his cousin, is there baptizing. They call him John the Baptizer is preaching, who is the son of Elizabeth and Zacharias, who were old of age, and a miracle happened. And then we see Jesus stepping on the scene. But in those 18 years, what was he doing? What was happening? Let me share with you six things that I noticed today in the passage of Scripture, and these are not very long. They're quick. They're simple and easy because it's what the Bible says. He was determining to grow. He subjected himself, the Bible said, to his parents. When they took him from that place at the age of 12, when they pulled him out of the temple and they went down, they headed down to the place of Nazareth or whatever, to the town as they was doing, that he subjected, subjected himself to them. You know, there's something about honor. We've lost out on kids honoring their parents, subjecting themselves to their parents. Amen. Learning how to, uh, to be loving and respectful, courteous, and all those things. I mean, I didn't grow up in, you know, just being in church didn't mean that's the only place where you learned how to behave properly or to act. Just because being in church, and that certainly ought to be taught. But sometimes that, we don't even see that with us adults sometimes in church, Amen. So when that comes, so Jesus subjected himself, the Bible says, because he was determining to grow in an environment to which God had planted him with Mary and with his stepfather Joseph, and as they had other children, because they did, Mary and Joseph had other kids, brothers and sisters for Jesus, which would be half brothers and sisters. And as they grew up in a family, but Jesus being the oldest of them. And so... He was determining to grow. You know, that's what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6. Honor your mother and father, kids. Honor your mother and father in the Lord, for this is right, that your days may be 
long on that. You know, to say that you would live a, a long life, there's no, of course, we have decisions we make. We do different things in our life that sometimes can take in drugs or, or being in places we are not to be and getting out because the wages of sin is what? The wages of sin is death. And you say, oh, but Brother Odell, Jesus didn't live to be but 33 years old. Yes, because the wages of sin is death. You know why Jesus died? Because not for his sins, but for our sins. Jesus died for us. That was God's gift to us. So, but in the he was determining to grow up, to grow and to learn as he did so. And the Bible says he increased as he continued to grow, he was the carpenter's son. Jesus learned a trade. Jesus was called the carpenter of Nazareth. You know, he knows how to build houses. In fact, he's working on one for me right now up in heaven. How about you? John 14, 1. What's Jesus tell us? You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Hallelujah. Going up there, I can just imagine the master carpenter is, is preparing that place for us when we die, when we leave this world. He, he, he grew, he increased, he, he learned Joseph, his stepfather's trade of a carpenter, it was no wonder that God placed him in that environment because later on he's going back to heaven. He lived in houses and huts, and he was born in a manger and stayed in a barn and all the different things. He grew up a lowly life. He didn't grow up as a rich person here in this life. He increased, the Bible says in wisdom, verse 47, all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. There's always more to learn. You never know it all. You know, when it comes to the point, and to prove whether it's right or wrong within your life of what you do is that we have the Bible to guide us because the Bible is the only thing, the Word of God, that does not change. It's everlasting. It's the living Word. In fact, James 1.5 says, If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask God. So if you want to be wise, ask God. Experience is going to help you in a way and things. But, you know, that's what Solomon asked, wasn't it? When, when God was saying, I'll give you anything. And that was the key thing to what Solomon want was to have wisdom. To be able to give the right answers, to know what the things are. You know, in, I think it's James 4.30, which says, To him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is. You know that verse. To him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. So when you think or feel like and say that you're doing this or you're doing that, or should I do that or whatever? Because the Holy Spirit will let you know within your life whether or not you ought to do that. The Holy Spirit will guide you, Jesus says, into all truth. So you don't have to ask anybody else really of that. But usually we do. We say, what do you think? And if we don't like the answer, we'll go to somebody else and say, what do you think, until we find someone that agrees with us about what we think. And so we're overly not really concerned about what God says about it at all because God is saying, if you do this, the Holy Spirit's going to tell you if whatever happens, you, because if, you, if we lack wisdom, you see, Jesus increased in wisdom. He kept, wisdom is going to tell you to make the right decisions within your life and to guide you throughout, not to get off the path, not to lose track of things, to be wise. Wise, as the Bible says, as serpents, but harmless as doves. But he also increased in stature. He grew. I don't know. I think he was like 10 foot tall. No, I'm teasing you know, did you notice the Bible doesn't tell how tall Jesus was? It doesn't say that he was six foot, he was 5'10", which is around my size, or he was 6'2", or, or whatever. 
But, you know, he was the strongest. He was the greatest man that ever touched upon this earth. The most powerful man alive. Samson was mighty. Samson was the strongest that we know physically before Jesus came along. But Jesus didn't even have to lift his little finger. Jesus could slap down storming waves that were pushing across the sea and tumbling over boats and all the different things. He said, peace be still. Let's imagine what Jesus could do. And, and just saying that how he speaks to us within our life to say, look at it. So Jesus grew in stature. He, he began to fill out and to become a man. I think that's what God's intent for us is as we are born is to grow up. Do you remember when people used to say, to you, why don't you just grow up? Now, why do they say that to you? Because you're acting like a little baby. You're acting like a little child. How does little children act? Little babies. Well, they go through periods of things. Sometimes they need, they need a, a change. Sometimes they need a little bottle or a pacifier. Take it away. Wah! Wah! Babies. You know, babies, when we're babies, we find a reason. Or if somebody takes our toy, if somebody, if somebody does this or that that, some, that doesn't please us, how do, how do we act as if we're staying babies? You know, the unfortunate part about many churches are, and many of us who are Christians, stays in our infancy. And we don't grow up and mature into Christ, to be Christ-like in our behaviors, in our actions. But you see, that's not normal. To be stuck in that way, it's not, it's not the normal thing. The normal thing is for us to be born and then to mature and to grow. And, and the responsibility of the parents is to provide the food and the shelter, the instruction and things. But if you say, get lost, old man, or do this or that. You reject authority, you reject this or that, and you're just going, I know what to do, and all these things, and you live, and, and you're, you're traveling on that broad way that leads to death and destruction. The way you travel will never get you to where Jesus intends you to be. So when Jesus grew in stature, he was leaving the infancy stage of the little manger in Bethlehem to come into this place. And man, by the time he was 12, I've heard of these child prodigies at the age of 12 to even today are in college or graduating college. I am amazed at that. Isn't that fascinating? They already got a master's or a doctorate by the time they're 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. They're out there. Uh, they're, out, they're out there. I guess I can plug in homeschool for some of them. It goes in because some of our public schools don't, don't notice that achievement. They, they want to pull the reins on that success and prosperity of somebody growing beyond. And I'm afraid that sometimes when I look at that and I see that sometimes in the house of God that we as believers will pull back the reins on people, keep them from growing because, listen, dear friend, you can grow as Christ. In, in Christ and as much as you want to spiritually in your life as you feed your soul through worship and praise of God and reading his word and listening and yield yourself, empty yourself. If you want to be full of God, empty yourself of everything else that's in there. God will not fill an already filled vessel, only an empty vessel. So he grew in statue, and it says, with favor with men, and favor with God. The amazing thing was is that people, you know, according to that, as he grew, people liked him. And then when politics got involved, he grew in favor. That means favorability that they were looking. That's, that's Jesus. What a fine boy. You know, look at all. They didn't understand everything about him. And they weren't for sure, and Jesus didn't show off or do anything else. He acted like a normal young man as he was growing up. That was the way God purposed until that point in time when God says, this is the time to step out, my son, now, 
in fulfillment of the prophecy to do, and it was at the time that he was a man, and he grew in favor with God. And in the garden, the test was there. He faced ridicule. He faced betrayal. All the different things. He was tempted, the Bible says, in all ways as we are tempted yet without sin. So there, you can't imagine any kind of temptation that Jesus, that you face that Jesus didn't face. Because it was there. He faced all those, th- but yet without sin. He did not yield to those things. The closest that Jesus came was there in the garden when the weight of everything hit him and his disciples. He kept coming to them and the church, and he would say, say, watch here and pray with me. And they, in the garden, every time he'd go back to them, that was the church. And it represents the church to say, here we are. And we say, well, we're tired. We got so many committee meetings, and, and we work, and we do all these other things. And, 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 but they lay there, Peter, James, and John, all the other. They laid there asleep, and Jesus says, couldn't you watch with me for one hour? And they fell asleep. And Jesus was gone, and he was battling because he was, he was increasing he was growing up. He was reaching the point of that maturity of the place to where that full surrender of his life because, you know, he says, well, they were so wonderful. Why did God take them? Because they were ready. You know, it doesn't matter that you're 70 years old or seven years old or seven months. God knows our days of what that, might, what that is. What happens part of our own maturity is the trust and surrender to the will of God of acceptance to know that God knows what's best in our life. So when Jesus went and prayed and he was saying, if there be any other way, Father, let this cut pass from me. Wouldn't we have felt that way? Is there any other way to do this besides this right here? But he would say, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And he surrendered himself. And you know what God said? When Jesus stepped into the baptismal waters there of the Jordan, when John the Baptist was up there and he was preaching and all Jerusalem was hearing, he said, repent, repent of your sins. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he looked over at the side of the Jordan River banks and there, lo and behold, he said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The first step of Jesus' ministry, when he reached that point of being 30 years old or thereabouts from the age of 12 as a child, when he was there and amazed all of the doctors and physicians, all the, the priests and, and the teachers and the religious thing of all that. And then for those 18 years, and all at once, there he is. Because John was the forerunner He was proclaiming that there's one to come, but John had the insight to be able to say he's the one. And Jesus started stepping into that water and walking out to John. And John, in his humility, when Jesus comes, said, I need to be baptized. And you wonder, well, what's that baptism about? And John John said, I need to be baptized of you. And Jesus said, no, it suffers us to fulfill the righteousness of the Father. But I need to be baptized because baptism represents the death and the burial and the resurrection of that new life. It, it symbolizes publicly here to say, and all the people that had stepped in before, imagine all the things that was happening because John says, behold, the Lamb of God. And at that moment when old John baptized Jesus, and brought him up. And that's another reason, dear friends, say you're not baptized for your sins. That happens. You know, Jesus wasn't baptized in water for his sins. You weren't baptized in water for your sins when you got baptized. If you was, it wasn't right because we're baptized. That water won't do anything for your sins. You're baptized in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the, the blood of Jesus. Jesus said, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So when we look at that, and Jesus, and all at once from heaven came the Father's voice and said, this is my son in whom I am well 
pleased. Jesus grew up. And he was in favor with people around him and with God. You know what he says? Jesus said, how can you say that you love God and you don't love the brethren around you? Pray with me. Heavenly Father, help us to grow in the areas of our life to be more mature physically, spiritually as the complete man, woman that you want us to be and as boys and girls as Jesus did to find your favor I pray in Jesus name Amen Would you stand please as Savannah comes to lead us in our invitation hymn this morning and uh it's just as I am again, and Brother Philip, he's on vacation, not here, and I appreciate Savannah so much as we sing together. But if you're in the back of the church, the front, the middle, if you need to come, I'll meet you right here at the front, pray with you. If you just need to come to this altar and pray, you do it as we sing, because the way we come is just as we are. Let God make the changes that need to be made changed in your life. for a moment please and uh, Marlene how about coming up here with me uh, just share while Natalie's and, and Rita you can give her any other information there that she needs this is Miss Marlene now I, I am just really amazed at what God is doing here you know just a few weeks ago uh, Jack Hyman came forward 86 years old and gave his had given his heart to Christ and was baptized and then right after that brother Dan 88 years old gave his heart to the Lord was baptized you mind me telling your age 86 <laughs> Marlene's 86 years old Lord spoke to her heart one day here and she knew she should have came then 
and had waited back uh, last year sometime she told me she said I want you to baptize me and I uh, went and visited them Friday morning with uh, this is Rita's sister Evelyn Evelyn our 106 year old member sister Evelyn uh, back there this is another one of Evelyn's daughters you know that we if you was watching on Facebook or different people and saw sister Evelyn the birthday party Marlene lives up in Pennsylvania but she comes here, stays a few weeks, comes down. This Orchard Crest is going to become her church family. And uh, she watches us, you know, on live stream. That goes to show you the connections, you know, how isn't it amazing the power of the Word of God. So if you join me in welcoming Marlene here into the family of God and following the Lord Wednesday night baptism, amen. Amen. Because I've had, all right. You want to say anything, Marlene? I just thank everybody. Just thank. Don't make me cry. It's a happy moment, isn't it? <laughs> Amen. Well, I'll let your sister come up and help you. Have you got everything, Natalie, you need? You can get it later. All right. Okay. Well, we want folks to be able to uh, give you a right hand of fellowship and things. So uh, we'll, we'll just have you to, and then I don't want to wear you out there. So, Rito, if you all want to stand here for a minute. Your mom, is she back there? Yes, All righty. So you all go back at the door? Okay. Why don't you all go ahead, and that way you can meet, and I'll meet Deborah. Will you go with them to meet the door there? And uh, Marlene, Reed, you all go back and get your mom. Yep, yep, and you can go with the, uh, yeah. And De go with Deborah there, and I'll come right along, tagging along like a little puppy dog. And uh, how about let's stand together, and let's just, I don't know, sing a little something as we, what can we sing? <clears throat> sing with me. I mean, sing over and above and louder than me. That's what I really mean. <laughs> okay. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my soul, in what you hear, may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. May the Lord bless you. I hope to see you Wednesday night.